uh, recognized as a very important nude item in the pathology of ankles and that is not well known within our sports medical field. And why do I say it? Because in an ankle sprain, you can be rewarded. You give physio, you give tape, and it will be fine because the ankle is so congruent. But if we missed from the start a syndesmotic injury, you have it for life. And a syndesmotic injury can be perfectly treated the first two months, but afterwards is a headache for the rest of your career with your athlete. So I wanted to highlight that as a specific item in our pathology. And what is it exactly? It is the uh, link between the distal tibia and the distal fibula where it goes wrong in these external rotation dorsiflexion injuries. So how do you address them? You listen to the mechanism of injury. It's not a simple inversion. It's a different mechanism of injury, as I said. Typically, patients have pain over the ankle sprain area, but the pain radiates up, and that's not typical for a normal ankle sprain. So that's something to look into. And then, of course, you can use your x-rays and your uh, clinical tests to go further. And one of these tests, one of the most patognomonic ones, is the squeeze test. You squeeze the distal tibia and fibula together, and you get this apprehension or radiation up. It's very helpful to do. The most uh, patognomonic test is the external rotation test, where you fix the heel and you ask an external rotation actively or by, by passive force, and you look for apprehension. And the last one is a fibular translation test, where you really do a drawer of the distal fibula towards the distal tibia. And these tests can give you an ID if it's more than a simple ankle sprain. But please don't call it a high ankle sprain because it has nothing to do with it. And then how do we grade them? We use our clinical exam and our X-ray or MRI to know how to, do, how to deal with that. A grade one means that the pain is mild, the X-ray is normal, and it's an incomplete injury. They do very well within a couple of weeks and they never require surgery. Grade threes are the bad ones. That's where the clinical examination is full blown and the x-ray shows widening. They always need surgery because they need to be fixed. And then we have the blurred line of the grade twos where you have a bit of instability, still sometimes normal radiographs, but positive tests. And these ones sometimes need surgery. And we have now algorithms that help us to define uh, how stable they are. And particularly, there are three reasons. If the deltoid, the medial side, would be involved, if one of the specific tests that I showed you is positive, or if you have that radiation up from the anterolateral ankle side up. These are three items. If you have one of these three positive, you have to think about syndesmosis. And this is a message uh, that I'd like to share because actually six years ago, I personally didn't know that. But now in my clinic, I see much more of these injuries than I thought. And we always learn from people like Professor Popovich, you only know or you only see what you know. So if you don't know about it, you don't recognize it. And I highly recommend you to dig into that if you do ankle pathology in your contact sports people, because the moment you know it, you will see them much more than you think. A last word on that uh, impingement can be, for example, a Bassett's lesion, where the syndesmosis ligament falls down and in, impinges on the joint. So it's a combination of ligament injury with impingement. It's the ligament that starts to induce inflammation because it fell down into the joint here. So don't think of it as separate entities. Think of it as combined entities. And then we have impingement on the back. You can have impingement between the tibia and the talus. You can have impingement on the backside of the talus. And you can have impingement all the way to the insertion of the Achilles. With the development of arthroscopy, we are now able to see the joint in the tibiotalar area, to see the flexor hallucis longus with all that new vascularization due to impingement from the backside. And we can go now all the way down to the Achilles tendon where we have to reshape this bone sometimes in order to remove the inflammation. And the same accounts for posterior impingement like anterior. If you don't know about it, or you don't master the clinical examination, you will miss it. Why? Because the x-ray that is taken from lateral here, you would agree with me, this is a normal x-ray. But if you look at the x-ray in an oblique way, you see this little piece.
that in a sedentary population will do nothing, but in an elite sports person will be a headache for a, a long time because it gives that impingement, inflammation and apprehension, and it gives the impossibility to play pain-free. So clinics first, confirm with a radiology and know about these things so you will find them. And the athlete will be very rewarded because uh, it's actually quite easy to treat. How do we do that? I won't go into detail. It's just an arthroscopic procedure that we have helped developing in order to make it safe and good. And you can see here, for example, a flexor hallucis longus impinged between the two bones. As you can see here, the tendon stops here and then the muscular belly is completely impinged. I think it's a clear sign of impingement that we can easily reduce by identifying the bony piece, removing it from the, the flexor hallucis, and then uh, you can see here that it can be liberated. You see the impressions on the tendon of that long-standing impingement, and the athletes are very happy with this, and I will show you why. Because for example, on the upper slide, you see an apprehension. The posterior impingement test is a hyperplantar flexion test that gives apprehension, as you can see on the upper slide. Now, immediately after surgery, you can see still the bandage. If you see the same uh, mechanism, you see that apprehension is gone. Um, the video up is not so uh, quality wise, but it's the same patient. So you can see that an, an apprehension like that, that limits the performance of the player big time, can easily be addressed. And as I said, if you know about it, you see it and you treat it. So far for the impingement, why don't we end with instability? Now, instability we have done with our teams at, in uh, surgery, uh, with our uh, performance uh, teams also. We have identified a lot of interesting topics that I'm happy to share uh, in another lecture. But I wanted to finalize with instability because we all know that everybody who doesn't know ankles very well thinks anything in the ankle is a sprain, which means the ligament. And it's boring because it always heals with, uh, with good physiotherapy and taping, so nothing to do about it. Well, it's not true. As you can see, instability in these cadaveric specimens create much more than just an unstable feeling. They create a lot of concomitant injuries of which cartilage is the number one victim. So instability has to be by all means or at all stakes be avoided for the future. And what is the primary problem of instability? It's having a previous instability. So you have to um, differentiate it from hyperlaxity. And you will say, ah, oh, that's easy. I challenge you, it's not always that easy. So see an ankle patient as a holistic approach where you look at the knee in recurvatum, where you look at the thumb in hyperextension, uh, where you look at the elbow in hyperextension, and you always have another ankle on your side. So it's very, very dangerous to diagnose instability if you didn't check for laxity, because actually many athletes, and especially uh, water polo players, gymnasts, uh, ballet dancers, have the ability due to their hyperlaxity to do things that nobody else can and that's why they become so good. So don't call any hyperlaxity instability. Now your question will be, when do you have to do surgery on a bad ankle sprain? It's easy and not easy, but it depends on five major things. It depends on the activity level of the athlete because the ankle is very congruent, very forgiving, unless you have an ankle that is uh, asked to absorb energies from contact sports that are high. You can check if it's acute or chronic. As I said, the chronic ones, they are the headache because they give the problems of cartilage lesions. And the acute ones are the ones we want to treat because once you have it, you can have it for life and you have one chance in an acute ankle sprain to stop that process. And then it's very important to see if it's mechanical or functional instability. What do I mean by that? Mechanical means that you test with your drawer tests, as I've showed uh, uh, in, in my previous video on hyperlaxity, the mechanical instability, where the functional instability is the feeling of the athlete of repetitive spraining, the feeling of instability. So both are very important 
to define before you decide what to do. And then you have to know if there's real pain confirmed, if there's real effusion combined, because that means the cartilage is already injured also. So you start to have a cascade of problems. And then the last thing is, of course, if you can have access to imaging, whether it's X-ray, ultrasound, MRI, but it can be helpful to define. So these are the major stakeholders to decide upon further uh, instability or not. And you have two ligaments in the lateral complex of the ankle that you have to test. It's the ATFL, the anterior talofibular ligament that we test with a drawer test like you see now. And it's uh, the Taylor tilt test that I should show you here, where you really, no, this is uh, the medial test. I'm sorry, that's not the Taylor test. The, this is a medial test, which is called uh, a modified Kliger test, where you can see if the deltoid is also involved. But remember, ATFL is the anterior drawer test, and CFL is the Taylor tilt test. And these are two very simple tests, very pathognomonic to know how it's going on. And I wanted to share with you a few photos from intraoperatively, where you see here a total detachment of the ATFL-CFL complex on the distal fibula, where we clean it up, where we put some wires through a bony tunnel, and we fix it back in order for the athlete to play after four to five weeks. I want to end after cartilage, fractures, impingement, uh, instability, syndesmosis. I want to end with some little things that I would like to kind of uh, share with you because you will encounter them and it's always good to share knowledge on. You will see athletes who say, Doc, I have this flipping on my ankle. It's not really painful, but it's annoying because it limits my, my, my force. Uh, these, most of the time on the lateral side, are peroneal injuries over the tendon that flips in the front. And just by reshaping the distal fibula groove and putting a raffi over the, flex, the retinaculum perineum, uh, you can already uh, help a lot in that. Another thing is, for example, a haglund. Uh, a haglund can be seen by uh, long jumpers, by uh, other types of Olympic uh, jumpers, where they do repetitively jumping. And you see on the very distal part of the, the heel, all these bony spurs. Now with arthroscopy, we are able to clean it up and in a very minimal invasive way, without touching the tendon, uh, debrided. So the newer techniques have helped us to do the same thing as the open techniques, but in a much more uh, less invasive way and in a way where we can go faster to return to play. Another word, for example, on Achilles tendinosis. You see here a big nodular tendinopathy over the Achilles. We now know that if you look into it with endoscopy, you see here the Achilles tendon, here the plantaris tendon, and we now know that fibrous bands that are being created by repetitive overload in sports are the instigator of that nodular tendinopathy of the Achilles tendon. So instead of touching the Achilles tendon with all the problems involved, we nowadays denervate this area, not touch on the tendon, and make the pain go away. All things that have developed through the newer techniques in surgery. I want to show you, for example, this athlete. This is the number one uh, triple jumper in the world on the Doha uh, Track and Field World Championships, where in his third attempt to break the world record that he owns, by the way, and as an Olympic champion, he ruptures his Achilles tendon. This is the Thompson test where you see in an athlete like that, that there's no more movement on the plantar flexion side. And what happens when you open that, you see here a total nightmare of tendinous pathology over the ankle. Now, this is an athlete that put eight times his body weight once he jumps off or once he really pushes off for his attempt to break his record. So this is not a simple suture you have to make. You have to make this suture so strong that it can tolerate the loads in an Achilles tendon uh, quality deficit type of pathology meaning this has ruptured because the tendon can't hold it the, the the cells can't hold it so many things to consider in line with that but thanks to our newer techniques this is what the athlete then sends after three months and a half look on what he's doing 
This is what he sends after five months. Now, we are not talking about the regular athlete. We're talking about champions. So don't think our patients do all like this after five months. They only do it after nine months with good rehab. But these people push themselves to the limit. And that's the thin border that we're sometimes working in. And that's what we all share. And sometimes we don't uh, sleep well because of it. But on the other hand, it's very rewarding to try to combine our knowledge and share our techniques and develop together to get to this phase of making our athletes better, stronger, and in a faster way. Nine months after this, uh, he developed, he became French champion again. So it is possible, even in the most disastrous ways, to combine the mentality of the athlete, to combine good techniques in surgery, and join with great sports medical support through rehabilitation and follow-up to, to, to bring service to these athletes, to, to bring them back to their dream. But Achilles tendon ruptures are still a big headache with big problems that can be uh, sometimes uh, yeah, difficult to treat. But I wanted to share that with you because the message here is by joining forces, we can achieve this together. And a very last word, I know it's not the ankle, but in many, many sports, we see metatarsal five fractures like in handball, uh, landing positions like in volleyball and like in football. And uh, the work by our teams have seen that we see a lot of uh, malunions there, a lot of pain due to the hardware when you have to fix it. And we now have identified that when we put pressure plates in the football shoes and we look at the plates, once we let them uh, move again or, or load after three months, we see that, for example, a patient who had surgery is not loading his metatarsal five anymore. So are they really healed? No, they're not. We are not happy with this. And we see in our plantar plate testing that when you do a stance, leg kick, a curved run or a running, we can identify where is the load. As you see here in a curved run and in a leg kick like a corner, we see a lot of load on that area where when you run at 5.5 millimeter per, se meter per second, you have no load. So instead of waiting and putting these people in casts for a long time, we nowadays let them do specific things while keeping their sport specific possibilities and without overloading them. And this is my last message to all of you that ankle pathology can be easily treated most of the time with physiotherapy, but it's our duty to identify the athletes with injuries like that, that cannot be treated with uh, immediate classic physiotherapy. Because if we don't identify them, we don't treat them well. And uh, we're talking about only 15% of athletes with ankle injuries, but it's mandatory that we identify them to give them the best service. And I wanted to end to thank you very much for all. I hope I stayed within my time, uh, yeah. But uh, if you need any more information, we have been working with our teams uh, like Professor Popovich, with our teams like with Professor Vukovic, and also in chapters with uh, Professor Bukva and Professor uh, Krivokapic and many, many others uh, to try to make a difference. And anything you need, we have this all at hand. We can send it to you. It would be an honor and a privilege to join forces in that. And uh, with that, I give the floor back to you, uh, Bria. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to answer some questions if there would be any. Well, thank you, Dr. De Hodge, for everything. Uh, it was a great uh, lecture. I actually got a lot of uh, private messages here on my phone that people are really excited that uh, you gave us great opportunity to see all this case. Uh, unfortunately, there was a lot of with the recording, uh, so something with my cloud was not working, so I will not going to have the entire uh, lecture, but most of it is recorded and I will send that to all the participants. Uh, now I will just remind the audience then when you click on the manage participants, you can have the option of um, uh, raising your hand. So if you want to ask some question to the report, please just raise your hand and I will call for your name and you can uh, ask uh, the question. So, uh, okay, for now, uh, we have one uh, hand up, so that is uh, Philip. Uh, okay, Philip, I will unmute you so you can uh, ask the question. 
So, uh, Philip is uh, one of our students. He is involved with athletics uh, at medical faculties. He's a marathon runner, so he has uh, something really interesting to say. So, Philip, go on. Hello, it's my pleasure to meet you at least online here. It was my pleasure to listen to this interesting lecture. And as a young doctor and by, as an athlete runner also, I wanted to ask you if you need to choose just one sport, like football, athletics, basketball, or tennis, for example, in which sport ankle injuries could have the worst clinical prognosis, according to your experience? Thanks, Philip, and I uh, and, uh, appreciate your, your question. Now, I think you have to look at it from a sport-specific point of view. Because uh, when we talk about cartilage, in, for example, a football player, this can be career-ending. In a volleyball player, you would be able to treat it in a better way or at least keep the career running because there are different types of load coming on it. Uh, having said that, I've seen disastrous uh, ligament injuries in volleyball players, in real elite volleyball players, where we didn't do surgery because they are so strong in their jumping sports. But we would do for the same injury in a grade three lateral sprain, for example, in a football player, we would do surgery. So it's very sport specific and it really depends on the loads that you ask. I think one of the most complete sports that I have encountered is handball players. And I don't say it because our champion is uh, listening. I say it because they are so complete in all the skills they have and in the mentality they have to push forward. And also in the ability to absorb load, to come into balance after being brought out of balance and in the ability to use their skills to the best potential. But I would say, it's very sport specific. In some cases with the same injury, I would treat them differently because of the loads that is being asked for. I hope that makes sense to you. Yes, thank you a lot. Okay, uh, there is one more hand raised. It is from Dr. Krivokopic. Uh, I think that uh, you two are great friends. So let me see what Bane has, has to ask you, okay? Hello? Go on, guys. Hello. hello, hello, Peter. Uh, so great to see you, at least like this, through camera, but I really hope that we're going to see each other live soon. It was a great presentation, and <clears throat> as, as always, you're doing it very well. Uh, I would like to ask you, maybe this is more orthopedic question, but I hope there are some participants from orthopedic, uh, about the patient that you showed with a Achilles tendon rupture. Uh, because we saw it's, it's a disaster uh, and very, very bad injury. Uh, what would you prefer as a surgical technique uh, in these in this cases? Well, uh, thanks, uh, Bonnie. And uh, first of all, you see, since you left Aspetor, I have to wear glasses now. <laughs> you still are so young. Uh, and, uh, unfortunately. We lot, and we follow you very closely. And congratulations with all your achievements since then. I really uh, honor that. Um, when we talk about Achilles tendons, the most important is to identify the location. Um, when we have what we normally have is the mid portion Achilles tendon rupture. And uh, for that rupture, when we talk about surgery in the, in the athletes, you can use classic Kessler stitches. I personally use one fiber wire two and two Vicryl two. It's a bit technical, sorry guys, but every time Kessler stitches and then I join with two Nakata stitches. This works for me in a mid portion. But for example, in a distal one, I would use an, uh, a speed bridge technique where I use the bone to, to keep it holding. But for example, in an area where you have a muscular tendinous junction problem, I would go percutaneous with our, uh, with our techniques uh, that are percutaneous. We actually published this recently together with James Calder from uh, London Imperial, where we have uh, given an algorithm uh, in how to treat it. So, uh, so it's not uh, just like, for example, with ACL in the knee, people say it's an ACL. It's so much more different than, than that, as you know. So I would say Achilles tendon most of the time mid portion, 
but there are ex exceptions when you go up or down. Uh, okay, we, uh, Bonnie, do you have some more questions for Dr. De Hodge? Uh, no, I, I will let some, somebody else to ask. Thank you very much again, Pete. Okay, thank you. So we have one uh, more hand that is raised. So Dr. Milos Bojevic, Milos, hello, you can ask your question, Dr. De Hodge. Hello. Hello, you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear yeah. you now. Hello, Peter, nice to meet you. Emma. Uh, first of all, I want to wish you a good health to you and your family. Thank you for your time and, and great lecture. I would also like to thank Professor Sanja Mazic and Professor Popovic in particular for making this possible for us. It's a pleasure to hear something like this and, and learn something new this way. So far, I could only hear you on Asperger Tuesday lectures on, on, on YouTube. So now I can ask you questions. So, so here it is. I know that you are an orthopedic surgeon and you are an excellent one, but you often mention in, in your lectures the necessity of making a rehabilitation guide based on the mechanism of injury. In your opinion, how far have we come with making such a guide and is it possible to expect something like that in future from Aspeter, similar to, to, to hamstring and uh, adductor injuries protocol? Milos, I love your question. Thank you. Uh, actually, you've nailed it. Uh, I, I recently had the chance to do a systematic review on return to plane after ankle sprain. And you know ankle sprain is the number one injury in sport. So we're not talking about a, a, a rare injury. Do you know how many times in the 3,600 articles that we have identified, there was a mentioning or a clear mentioning of the rehabilitation protocol? No. 5.5%. So we are doing it wrong from the start, because if we are not able to talk the same language, we will never reach a consensus. And that's for the most common injury in sports. You can imagine how much we are looking at syndesmosis, because we treat them in rehabilitation the same way like an ankle sprain. We do proprioception, we do stabilization, and it works in a way because the ankle is so congruent, but it doesn't work in the long term. So we are urgently in need for validated rehabilitation programs with discharge criteria to improve. And it's actually an untouched area in literature. So I would, I would really, really stress that whoever is working with ankle pathology in sports will be grateful for the ones who bring it to us. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, another one? Uh, yeah, I think you, you can go for the another one. Is that okay, Dr. Hodge? So Milos would like to ask another question. Yeah, yeah, great. Go on. Okay. Your PhD thesis is, a, it is a, a such a great ma manuscript and, and a great source of relevant information regarding ankle injuries. It is available on, online on, on uh, Liège University and, and people can, can find it there and, and download, download it. In uh, uh, your uh, chapter two is entitled, There's No Such Thing as a Simple Ankle Sprain. You also start your lecture with that. And that's my favorite sentence, sentence I've been saying to injure, to injure the athletes, both professional and recreational. Since I read the uh, professor's Nick Van Dyke clinical commentary on the 2016 International Ankle Consortium position statement, since it was published in, in, in BGSM, I, I, I think in October that year. Regarding that, how important in your own opinion is uh, to educate the, the athletes to understand that this is not a harmless injury and that it is necessary to be disciplined and patient in, in order to recover the tissue as best as possible and to make the functional recovery as good as possible because they usually believe that there is a simple ankle sprain, unfortunately. Um, another uh, nail, because that's what we all encounter in our uh, clinical setting. I completely confirm with you but the big problem is that there's a need for mentality change. Why? 
if you have a player with, let's say, an ACL rupture in the knee, there is a common, a common feeling by all athletes that this might require surgery. If you have a grade three injury in the ankle, that mentality is completely different. Now, the evolution of a grade three ligament injury over time is as bad as an ACL rupture. But the idea or the perception of it is completely different. And why is that? Because with an incongruent joint like the knee, you have instability and you feel you can't go on. The problem is that an ankle is much more forgiving due to its congruency and you will go on and the, sh the athletes will tell you, look, doc, you see, you were wrong. I can do it. Look at me. But over time, you've treated them badly. So it's very hard to convince uh, everybody that this is something to consider to avoid combined lesions over the, the, the long run. And actually, we have done very bad in literature because we didn't, we didn't publish methodologically good studies to prove it. So it's our own fault because the athlete is right. He or she can play with it. The problem is they don't understand that they need to be treated over the mid to long term to be good with that. So the mentality has to change and it's our duty altogether to show the world through literature that that's the only way to change the perception. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Sorry for my long answer. Eh? No, no, thank you. Uh, well, okay. I would like to call other uh, participants of today's lecture to ask questions to Peter. So anybody else? As you know, option raise your hand. So when you click on manage participants, you can raise your hand and ask a question. Uh, no, no. Well, uh, in that case, I can use the opportunity to ask one uh, to Peter. So uh, maybe something more specific, uh, specific to the injuries of the uh, lateral ligament complex. So sometimes we are not sure, are we going to treat that uh, conservatively or surgically? So can you give us some um, uh, indications, surgical indications so that we can manage on the field? So what is like the take home message when we have the injury of this ligament complex? So what are the, the, indi the surgical indications when this injury should be treated surgically and not so conservatively? Thank you. Thanks. First of all, um, every, lateral ligament injury, every can be treated with physiotherapy in a very good way. So there's never a wrong message. We as surgeons, we believe, and we have shown with our, with our uh, literature uh, studies that there are case by case specific indications to go for surgery. What are they? They are basically, as I said, sport specific. You can have a grade three lesion that can be treated differently. But for example, in, an, uh, in a good football player, and we actually had the chance to perform uh, that in a Red Star uh, uh, player. Uh, I'm sorry for the, the, the competitive club's uh, uh, supporters for the moment. Um, but what are the indications for surgical repair of a lateral ligament complex injury? is first of all sport specific. If you have an instability during sports, performing sports, that is very functional. And if that is combined with mechanical, with your testing, which is the drawer test and the tailor tilt test, you have to see if there's an indication. Now the number two indication would be combined lesions. You cannot accept a sprain that has a combined, for example, medial Taylor dome lesion in the cartilage to heal in the ligament and then to have uh, new problems in the future over the cartilage. So combined lesions and sports specific grade three lesions are number one. Uh, all the rest is more like a gray zone of decision making. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I think that like, once again, it should be like the team uh, decision, but uh, for all the doctors that are just in the sports medicine area and are working on the field, I think it uh, would be a great advice. So 
Uh, I would like to ask the uh, audience for once, once again to ask a question. No. Well, I hope, Peter, so first, thank you for uh, the lecture and thank you for this uh, great answers that you gave to our audience. We all enjoyed your uh, lecture and I hope that uh, the experience was the same uh, to you. And uh, hopefully we will meet again here through webinars, but maybe also in person in Belgrade, so that uh, we can also have the opportunity to uh, hear you uh, in this live uh, uh, manner and maybe ask questions via, via some uh, oral presentation given by you. Uh, so I would also like to uh, call all the participants for the next week. We will also going to have the lecture that will be given by Dr. Jarko Vucković. Of course, I will, Peter, send you the invitation with all of the data if you want to participate. But uh, as you can see, this e-forum is uh, growing uh, week by week. So we will announce uh, all uh, our lectures by, one by one. And we hope that our audience will stay uh, with us even when uh, the... Uh, situation in Serbia gets uh, stabilized without this uh, like uh, cube when we are in our home so that you will still re uh, remain interested in the lectures given on this forum. So once again, Peter, thank you for the great uh, lecture. Thank Professor Popovic to uh, give us the opportunity to connect with you uh, and uh, to Professor Mazic that also organized this on behalf of the Center for Sports Medicine and Exercise Therapy in Belgrade. Uh, so just one thing came on the chat. Uh, yeah, there, there are thank you notes also in the chat for this um, lecture. So thank you uh, everyone for this. It was a great uh, experience and see you all next week. Peter, do you have something to maybe tell for the end or not? Thank you very much. I can only wish you best health uh, with you and your families. And hopefully we can uh, enjoy ankle injuries again instead of talking about it in clinic. And uh, so that would mean that we can enjoy again what, we're, what we like to do, which is serving our athletes and that they are performing again. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. So goodbye, everybody.